For today's decision, we've got a case of national pork producers versus the Department of Food and Agriculture of California from the United States Supreme Court. So what happened in this case is the state of California put in place standards with respect to how pigs are raised and how pork that comes from that pigs are sold. So California said, okay, if you want to sell pork in our state, it must come from pigs that are kept in this particular way. You know, they must be kept in pens this big, they must be kept this way, blah, 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 right? This is how the pigs must be kept. Well, of course, as is relevant, these standards are stricter than federal law would require. All right, California is putting in place more onerous requirements with respect to how the pigs are kept. So this poses potentially a bit of a problem because now other states have a bit of an issue when it comes to selling to California, which of course is a major market. So this trips what's called the Dormant Commerce Clause of the Constitution. The United States Constitution gives the power to control interstate commerce to Congress. Congress is the one that gets to say how interstate commerce is done. So that is the Commerce Clause. But the negative implication is called the Dormant Commerce Clause. If Congress has the power to control commerce, then by implication, any individual state does not have the power to control commerce. Okay? So you run into this problem. But you also have the idea that states get to control their own state law. So now you are in this balance, okay, where you have these issues. So a state puts in place a regulation or a law that in some way would reflect interstate commerce and make that trade less common. All right, so under what circumstances can you do that? All right, how do you determine if you can do that? So that's what this case is about. Did California go too far in its regulations in such a way that puts an undue burden on other states' ability to sell pigs to California. And it's a nightmare fuel split case, split decision, trying to figure all this out. So we are going to read this and understand it, no problem. Let's get started with this. This in case involves a challenge to a California law known as Proposition 12, because like so many of these things, it started out with a voter, because, well, California, for better or worse, Ha allows its voters more control when it comes to the citizen petitions. And sometimes the things they come up with lead to some interesting legal consequences as one would expect. So the California voters voted on this thing, which is relevant here, would forbid the sale in California of pork meat that comes from pigs that are confined in what California considers to be a cruel matter. So the, the way that they're kept, California considers to be cruel. The relevant law says it would be cruel if it prevents a pig from lying down, standing up, fully extending its limbs, or turning around freely. The relevant law is came into place because proponents suggested the law would benefit animal welfare and consumer health, and opponents claim that existing farm practices did better than this with respect to it. So it's not necessary, and would be counterproductive, and we like the ability to sell pigs the way we already do. Thank you very much. Shortly after the adoption, two organizations, the National Pork Producers Council and the American Farm Bureau, filed this lawsuit for members who raise pigs in other places, alleging that the relevant law violates the U.S. Constitution by impermissibly burdening interstate commerce. That is the language that you're looking for, impermissibly burdening interstate commerce, dormant commerce clause. Congress gets to regulate commerce. States do not get to regulate interstate commerce. So it is illegal if it impermissibly burdens interstate clause. What makes it permissible or not? Let's find out. Petitioners estimate the cost of compliance would increase production costs and would fall on both California and out-of-state producers. One of the ideas being, of course, that they would have to raise their pigs, all their pigs, in a way that would be compliant with California law, which would also increase the price of pork in other places, because California is such a huge market, right? It would become impractical to raise certain pigs some ways for California and other pigs for other markets. So the most the most efficient solution would be to raise all the pigs compliant with California, but that would raise costs, not just in California, but nationwide, because it would put in more of a burden. So costs would go up everywhere. So consumers in Illinois suddenly have to pay for California's choices, potentially. 
But because California imports almost all the pork it consumes, yeah, there's very little pork made in California. I forget exactly what the number was, but it's like less than 1%. It's very, very low. Uh, most of the compliance costs will be borne by out-of-state farms. The district court held that petitioners failed to state a claim. The Ninth Circuit affirmed. U.S. Supreme Court agrees. So uh, I, there is no problem. Everything is fine. California can do this. We don't need to think about it any harder. <laughs> I'm skimming. <coughs> this is a nightmare. Yeah. The Constitution vests Congress with the power to regulate commerce among the states, interstate commerce. Although Congress may seek to exercise this power with respect to pork, and many pork producers have asked Congress to step in, Congress has not placed a law that would explicitly overturn this. So they went to, they went uh, some, this little piggy go to market, this little piggy go home, and this little piggy go wee, 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 all to the houses of Congress. But Congress decided not to act on the pork-related petition. Petitioner's theory thus rests on the Dormant Commerce Clause theory, pursuant to which Congress not only has the power to regulate interstate commerce, but also the contra, which is that states can't do that. Uh, this court has held that state laws offend this aspect when they seek to build up dom domestic commerce through burdens on industry and businesses of other states. So one of the ways we look to see if this is improper is if what you're trying to do is favor your own children. You know, yeah. we, we are trying to pass a law that will uh, favor California uh, producers more than other producers. We're trying to build up our own industry. So it's like, no, you, you can't do that, all right? At the same time, the court has reiterated that absent purposeful discrimination, a state may exclude from its territory or prohibit the sale of articles which in its judgment are prejudicial to the interests of its citizens. So as long as we are not trying to help our own children, the wonderful citizens of New York, as long as we're not trying to, you know, discriminate in this respect, then we have the right to exclude things from our state boundaries if we wish. Great. This right. anti-discrimination. Well, yeah. You said New York. And I know you were going to the New York cows case. <laughs> Dairy. Did I say New York? <laughs> yeah. I knew exactly where your head was too. Dairy cows in New York. New York, <laughs> California, pigs, <laughs> cows. It's all the same. Damn it. The anti-discrimination principle wow. lies at the very core of the court's domination. Dormant. The anti-discrimination. What? I'm no, working dormant here. commerce. Dormant I know. I'm commerce. working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> the anti-discrimination principle lies at the very core of the court's dormant commerce clause. This court has said that the clause prohibits enforcement of state laws driven by protectionism. That is regulatory measures designed to benefit in-state interests by burning out-of-state competitors. So again, are we trying to favor our own children? Petitioners here disavow any discrimination-based claim, contending the, that contending the law imposes the same burden on in-state producers as it imposes on out-of-state producers. So it's the same law that burns everyone everywhere, but that in and of itself is not going to get you past this because the courts are not this dumb, right? We've written a superficially neutral law that applies to everyone everywhere. But we know that as a matter of practical reality, this law will have different impacts. And so it's like, ah, we're not going to say that California pork is best pork. We're going to say best pork is pork that meets these criteria, which just so happens to be California pork by mere coincidence. What are the odds, right? We're not this dumb. So just the fact that it's neutral is not going to get you past this. Given the fact that they say it does not implicate the anti-discrimination principle, they try to get around this problem by saying it's extraterritoriality. So, Cong so California is trying to regulate outside its own territory, which obviously California can't do. California can only regulate inside its own borders. So it can't pass regulations that extend outside its borders. They contend the court's dormant commerce clause analysis suggests additional and almost per se rule that forbids enforcing state laws that have the practical effect of controlling commerce out of state. Con 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 California cannot regulate in Illinois, even where those laws do not purposely discriminate. So even if discrimination is not the problem, we can't regulate outside our own boundaries. All right, let's try that argument. Petitioners insist the law offends 
this per se rule because the law imposes substantial new costs on out-of-state producers who wish to sell their products in California. Petitioners contend this rule they propose falls from three different cases. So we say, okay, we've got precedent three different ways. But a look at those cases reveals that each case typifies a familiar concern with preventing purposeful discrimination. So the Supreme Court says, okay, you've actually misread our case law. The issue isn't extraterritoriality in these cases at all. The issue is discrimination. So you have misread our precedent. In the relevant law from New York with the dairy farm producers that Rob mentioned earlier, New York tried to bar out-of-state dairy producers from selling their milk in the state for less than a minimum price New York guaranteed by law. That would discriminate against out-of-staters by erecting an economic barrier protecting a local industry. So they set a minimum price for the thing and, you know, that not so much. You can't do that. In a different case, the New York law required liquor distributors to affirm their in-state prices were no higher than out-of-state prices. And this impermissibly sought to force out-of-state distillers to surrender cost advantages to what? So different markets have different prices, not for the least of reasons, incidentally, because of different regulations. So maybe the reason the price is higher in New York than other states is because New York, as a matter of its own state law, has put in place additional compliance requirements, which increase costs and inhibited the market and increased costs. Some states allow anyone to open a liquor shop. Some states say only the state can do it. Some states say you can only sell this kind of alcohol in this kind of store or only this kind of way. Some states have labeling requirements or taxing requirements or whatever. And maybe those are the reasons the price is high. But New York tried to get around this problem, not by saying let's lessen our regulation and being competitive, but let's simply require other states to have the same price so that people won't go out of state to buy liquor. So we won't be, we won't be burdened by our own dumb choices <laughs> because we were the one that made it expensive in the first place. So, you know, that's dumb because other states, you know, are regulating it differently and the price is cheaper and, you know, you can't force them to have higher prices. No, that's dumb. As the court rather explained, uh, in Connecticut, they uh, hoard consume commerce for the benefit of in-state merchants and discourage consumers from crossing state lines. I bet they do try to discourage it, but, you know, people are free to travel. So maybe solve this problem by, you know, not having as much regulation would be great. Petitioners insist that these laws, taking these cases together, establish a rule that state laws with extraterritorial... Petitioners insist that these cases taken together establish a rule that extraterritoriality is invalid. While petitioners point to language in these cases regarding practical effects, the language of an opinion is not always to be parsed as though we're dealing with the language of a statute. So that's fair enough, right? The Supreme Court writes things, and they write things in a way to express ideas. But their exact words sometimes are not as important as the ideas. They're not to be parsed like a statute. So yes, they have talked about out-of-state effects, but that didn't mean that they were talking about extraterritoriality. They were talking about discrimination. So, you know, you're, you're focusing on the words versus the idea. Do you think Gorsuch could could hide his skepticism any 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 better? Mm. I mean, he, he's he's kind of going ham at it. I think he's used it almost per se rule. He's quoted that text like four times. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Think I think uh, they have some hostility to the concept. I I would believe so. Plus, uh, say extra ter extraterritoriality like five times fast. <laughs> extra extraterritoriality. 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 <laughs> Damn it. Okay. A closer look at the cases, because you can't read our cases because you're idiots. Ha ha ha. You can't read our language, you stupid people. A closer look at these cases reveals nothing like this. So, no. And, uh, and the petitioner's reading would cast a shadow over laws long understood to represent valid exercise. So, uh, no. You're, you're completely misreading our law. You, you suck at reading. Try harder. The relevant cases did not mean to do this much. In rejecting the petitioner's theory, the court does not mean to trivialize the role territory and sovereignty bar barriers play. 
the Constitution takes great care to provide rules for fixing and changing state borders. Uh, you know, fair enough. You know, so the borders are the borders, and you know, states can only operate inside their borders. So, you know, we 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 do take note that California is California and not Nevada, for example. Courts must sometimes referee disputes about one where one state authority and another begins, both inside and outside commercial context. Yeah, the Supreme Court, unfortunately, is burned with that role a lot. They have to children. help the children when they squabble, which happens children somewhat frequently. <laughs> Indeed, anti-discrimination principles found in the Dormant Commerce Clause analysis may well represent one more effort to mediate these claims. But none of this means that any question about an ability to project its power must yield to almost per se rules. So basically, states may have some out-of-state effect, but that doesn't itself mean that's a problem because basically, especially today, it would be very difficult to write a statute that would have no out-of-state impact. That would be difficult. You couldn't do it. In the modern era with modern commerce and people's ability to travel through states and our, our, our nationwide network, writing a statute that had only interstate effects, interstate effects would be difficult. So if we said that, that basically would prevent states from doing stuff, and that would be really dumb. This court has never claimed so much ground for judicial supremacy under the barrier of dormant commerce. So no, that is not what that means. Petitioners then point to a different case, which they assert requires the court to at least assess the burden imposed by a state law and prevent its enforcement if it's clearly excessive in relation to benefits. So maybe we'll do some sort of balancing analysis. Let's look at how much it burdens localities in your own state versus out of state. And maybe if it's too much out of state, then maybe that's the problem. It's a slippery slope. Court doesn't want to do that. Petitioners provide a litany of reasons why they believe this relevant law secures for Californians do not outweigh the cost it imposes on outstate of cost. So whatever benefit you're getting is more expensive than the cost you're imposing outside your borders. The Supreme Court chides petitioners by saying they overstate the extent to which Pike and its progeny depart from this rule. Overstate the extent. That sounds like um, uh -huh. minimized language. That sounds like uh, a bench slap to me. Overstate the extent sounds like you're an idiot. This thing does not say what you think it says. You're a complete <laughs> moron. You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> overstate the extent is uh, Supreme Court for, you fool. Uh, they overstate the extent to which the law re rule lies at the court of the court's dominance. At, as this court has previously explained, no clear line separates that case from core anti-discrimination precedent. If some case focuses on whether a law discriminates on its face, which, you know, fair enough, if you can figure it out on its face, then great. Then that case pike serves as an important reminder that a law of practical effects may also disclose discrimination. So it's not the burden in and of itself. It's not the burden is higher on out of state. It is that is evidence of discrimination. The test, the Supreme Court is trying to tell you as they beat you over the head repeatedly with the stick over and over again. <laughs> how can you not read? How can you not read? The relevant <laughs> test is discrimination, okay? Yes, you may be able to determine that from the burden, but it's evidence, not the conclusion, okay? So stop doing this. It's discrimination, you fools. That's the standard. The relevant law also concerned itself with an Arizona order requiring cantaloupes in the state to be processed and packed, packed in state, okay? So in that case, Arizona said, I don't know why, but this is apparently what Arizona wrote with their free time, okay? We think that all cantaloupes sold in the great state of Arizona should be packaged within Arizona. How do states oh. think of this law? How do, why on God's earth is the Arizona state legislature with their time saying, you know, it would be great. What if all if the cantaloupes here, were packaged here, in Arizona? Pack it here. Yeah, if you grow it here, you got to pack it here, basically. Who thinks of this stuff? Apparently, the Arizona legislature does. Okay. All right. Anyways, that's what they did. The court held that this law violated Dormant Commerce Clause, stressing that even if the order could be fairly characterized as facially neutral, 
It required business operations to be performed in the state that could more efficiently be performed elsewhere. The practical effects thus revealed the discriminatory purpose. Discrimination, okay? Discriminatory purpose. An effort to insulate in-state processing from out-of-state competition, right? If we require all the stuff to be packaged in-state, then our in-state producers will obviously package a lot more stuff, even if it's more expensive. Maybe out-of-state producers are packaging more because it's cheaper, because of regulation. Maybe we should change our regulation. But what if we force them to package here? No. While a small number of our cases have invalidated state laws that appear to have genuinely non-discriminatory purposes, this falls well outside whatever that is. So no. The framers equipped Congress with considerable power. So once again, if you really think this is a problem, go tell Congress about it. Because Congress, as we know all too well, has insane amounts of power when it comes to interstate commerce. So, you know, go tell Congress about all your needs and they will fix you right up. While this court has inferred... A, yeah, yeah, possibly. While this court has inferred an additional judicially enforceable rule against certain state laws adopted even against the backdrop of congressional silence because of the discrimination, for example, the court has also suggested extreme caution. So, dormant commerce clause is a, a sort of extreme thing, right? It's not no state can impose on another because that would be basically borderline impossible, right? This is to be exercised cautiously, not freely, all right? This is a sort of reserve idea. It's negative implication, incidentally, from the constitutional text. So, you know, we don't do it that much. Disavowing reliance on this court's core Commerce Clause teachings Focusing on discriminatory state language. How many more times do you think they can use the word discrimination? I don't know. And how much more shade can Gorsuch throw in the direction of petitioners? Disavowing reliance on this court's core dom dormant commerce clause teachings, petitioners invite yeah. the court to endorse new theories. Wow. Petitioners, you don't know how to Supreme Court. You're really bad at Supreme Courting. You don't know how to read. You don't know how to argue. You don't know how to Supreme Court. You're a bunch of idiots. This is some serious shade. This is a lot of shade. You're really dumb. Okay. Uh, they would have this court imposed an almost per se. Again, there, there it goes. <laughs> he wrote <laughs> again. Against enforcement of state laws that have extra total of the effects, even those long recognized that virtually all state laws create ripple effects because, of course, they do. Alternatively, they'd have the court prevent a state from regulating the sale of ordinary consumer goods within its own borders on non-discriminatory terms, even though the relevant law of cases they invoke has never before done this. So, no. Uh, your theories are novel and stupid. Oh, like the, the court that faces case, like the oh, court oh. that faces place below, the court declines both in cautious invitations. Wow. Oh, oh, the shade. Oh, God, I love Gorsuch's writing. I love Gorsuch's writing. Wow. Wow. That's that's serious shade. You, you, you have disavowed our decisions. Your suggestions are incautious. <laughs> Respectfully speaking, children, we gave you all of it. We're they not overstate the extent to which our case law speaks on this issue. <laughs> Holy oh. shit. Holy shit, dude. This is wild. Take a shot every time they use the words extra totality or per se Almost or discrimination per se or discrimination. Holy shit. Anti-discrimination lies at the very core of our jurisprudence. Oh my god. Oh man. All right, so that wow, was, that so is that was that was as to parts. Let me see here. Th that that's not just affirming the ninth. So the ninth comes in with this ruling and you have that that strong of an opinion affirming the night that's pretty interesting where's gorsuch delivers the opinion of a court joined by whom gorsuch's comments and barrett's conclude that the balancing test would be inappropriate for any court to do <laughs> that's so gorsuch thomas sotomayor and kagan conclude that the allegations are insufficient as a matter of law to demonstrate a substantial burden as showing that requires before a court may impose this. 
Gorsuch, Thomas Barrett conclude that the petitioners not ask the court to treat punitive harms as freestanding harms cognizable. So your entire claim is fundamentally uncognizable from first principles. That's really bad shade. So it's basically the, the basically, if I'm reading this right, it's just disagreements over how stupid you are. It so really... the majority agrees you're, you're stupid. And then a couple of justices argue about how stupid you are. But I, <laughs> I, you know, this, this opinion is a mess, but look at these, look at these votes and the combinations and where these, in, where they're joining and parting. I mean, yeah. this is one where the court was Gorsuch, Thomas and Gorsuch, Thomas, and Barrett conclude, yeah, the welfare thing, we read that. Sodom and York Hagen conclude the judgment should be affirmed, not because the courts are incapable, but because petitioners fail to plausibly allege a burden. Wow. <laughs> See, that, and that tracks, that tracks. Sodom and York Hagen would have done it. They would have gone and slapped down states kind of governing their own, within their own territory. What's mm -hmm. Barrett say? Barrett concludes that uh, it should be affirmed because the burdens to be cognizable, uh, the benefits and burdens are incommensurable and plausibly allege a substantial burden on interstate commerce because it fails to uh, be felt primarily outside of California. Uh, so basically, it seems like if I'm reading this properly, it's actually 9-0 and it's just disagreements over how stupid you are. It does look like that. <laughs> but you know what? The test, we still have no freaking clue what the test is. <laughs> no, the dormant commerce clause analysis is a bit... Well, I, I think it ha might have something to do with discriminatory purpose. Oh, I you, think, you think so? <laughs> I, 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 I think, I think uh, going forward that you know lawyers would be uh, well advised to root their dormant commerce clause analysis in discriminatory purpose. I seem to be mentioning that several times. So I got I got that much of the note. That was great. That was remarkably entertaining. Yeah. Who says law can't be fun? Who knew? <laughs> see, this is what see, this is what guy, this is what people outside law don't appreciate. They don't appreciate how much fun regulation of pigs in pens can be. And how much, how much, how much shade can come from it. Pigs should be in pens this big, not this big. And the amount of shade that comes from it is enough to blanket the entire state of California in perpetual cloud. Or more of the point, every other state, because California is in the right. So California yeah. gets to have sunshine, and the other states can sit under the clouds like bad states that they are. 